God is good. Yes, and God is awesome. Yes, God is marvelous. Yes, he is. Thank God for him allowing us to be here this morning uh, to worship him in spirit and in truth, to sing praises to him, to pray uh, uh, and offer our petitions to God because we know he hears us. And then to say to God, thank you for just being so tremendous in our life. Good to see you on this morning. We have our good friends from Mississippi with us. Uh, Y'all remember Miss Canetta? And we got Mama with us. Yeah, yeah. It's good, to, good to have them. Good to have them with us. Yes, yes, yes. Um, uh, yeah, we ain't good this weekend. All right. <laughs> Yeah, we had some good old Mississippi cooking this oh, week. So we ate good. So if I sound sluggish, y'all bring blame it on mama. Man. <laughs> <laughs> but well, we are delighted to have them. Canetta uh, does a marvelous job where she is and when she was here working with the youth. She loves children. She loves educating them on God's word. And so we're just delighted to have her. Uh, stop in with us and to bring mama back in town with us and this is her first this is mama's first time worshiping with us so um yeah so you y'all make sure y'all hug on her and love her uh and, and try to try to swoon her to get back you know come on back right. this way <laughs> good to have you all right y'all so stand with me stand with me uh for the reading of the word stand with me look at romans chapter six Romans chapter 6, a familiar passage that you all know. Romans chapter 6. Paul says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in the newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, then certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. Thank you, you may take your seat. All right. For he who has died is free from sin. Yeah. All right. I want to tag this sermon for this morning, the death that gives life. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Death that gives life. Now, we, we have, you remember we started a little mini-series, uh, and we, we entitled it, Enter the Water and Come to the Table. Y'all remember that? Mm -hmm. You remember we looked at, we, we, we touched on Genesis chapter 1, and we saw when God had created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was full of darkness, and it was void, and the Spirit of God hovered over the, the face of the earth. And then we saw that God would separate the darkness with light and creates light, and then he would split the waters, creating the seas. And you remember that after splitting the water emerges a new earth. It emerges a new beginning. And then we saw, we touched on rather, the fact that after God had created this new earth, this new world, he places Adam and Eve in that world to tabernacle there, there to dwell there, to live there, and to eat with God, to dine with God. But then something happens, sin comes into the play, and Satan introduces to Eve uh, 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 the notion that she can live independently, separate and apart from God, and that God was withholding something from her, that God was cheating her out of living her best life. And so he tells her that she is not to eat of, uh, you can eat of any tree that's in this garden, but of this particular tree, the tree of, not, of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat of, 
Uh, and if you do, in that day you will die. That is, you will die spiritually. But we know that after that uh, comes a man by the name of Noah. And God has Noah to preach. Uh, some over a hundred years, Noah preaches that God's judgment will soon come upon the earth. And then you know that in Genesis chapter 6 and Genesis chapter 7, that the earth, the waters began to rain, uh, to come down and descend upon the earth. And that flood bear up the ark that God had told Noah uh, to build, right? And so we know that after building that ark, after the flood comes a worldwide catastrophe, uh, that God rescinds the waters, and Noah and his family were saved that day. But watch this. After the waters rescinded, comes and emerges a new earth, a new beginning a new world. What does God do? He takes water to destroy a former way of life. He buries that life and now new life comes to fruition. Well then as we fast forward you remember we look at Jesus's back. Well no we looked at Exodus chapter 14 13 and 14. You remember <clears throat> we saw where God dealing with his people Israel, he summons Moses to go and to tell Pharaoh to let my people go. The time has come that you are to now release my people so that they can worship me and they can sacrifice to me. And you remember, uh, old Pharaoh reneged on that promise, right? He had, he had given the notion that he would release God's people, but he does in his mind he goes after them, and then he, he had gathers up his army to pursue Israel. They reach the Red Sea, and you remember they become frantic because they look behind them, and they see that the, uh, the uh, Pharaoh and the Egyptians are vastly, vastly pursuing them. They cry out to Moses, Moses, what are we going to do? And you remember the famous words of Moses, he tells them, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. What does God do? He splits those waters, isn't that right? And they go on to dry ground, headed to the land of Canaan. Now, in typology, when we read what Paul would suggest to us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we see Paul picks up that same event, and Paul said, reminds us that Israel was baptized into Moses and saved that very day. It took place after God did what? Split the waters. Well, after he splits the waters, ushers in for Israel a new beginning, a new life with God, a new era that they would walk with God and no longer be slaves to Egypt and to Pharaoh and his army. They now have a new relationship with God. But when did it take place? After God split the waters. Well, then we fast forward a little. Y'all all right? We just recapping. We fast forward a little further and we get to Jesus in the river Jordan. You remember there was a man by the name of John the Baptist. John was baptizing, preparing the Jewish nation for the coming of the Lord. And you remember he's preaching a baptism of repentance, right? And so he tells them to repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now he is in the wilderness, but they come to a body of water called the Jordan River. You remember about this river because you remember as Israel approached the Canaan land, the promised land, that God, they came to the body of water called the Jordan River. What was God doing? He tells the Israelites, he tells Moses and the leaders, take the Ark of the Covenant, step your foot just into the tip of your foot into the water, and I will do what? Split the waters so that they can go in to the promised land. Y'all ain't catching me. What I'm trying to tell you, it happens after the water is split. And so now, he, they, Jesus is at that same river. God has providentially placed a new era at the river Jordan. John the Baptist is preaching. He's telling them, you had better get ready because a new day is dawning. 
the king has come, the Messiah has come, and now it's time for you all to be prepared for his kingdom. No longer will you get a promised land, you will now enter into a promised kingdom. No longer will you get Moses the prophet, but you'll get a new Moses by the name of Jesus the Christ. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? And but it comes after he splits the water. Now we get to Romans chapter 6. We get to Romans chapter 6. And couched in Romans chapter 6 is the motive of uh, the Israel exodus. He will actually, behind this, this passage, Embedded in Paul's mind is the excellence passage of God's people. He's still carrying on the idea of Israel leaving Egypt and going into a new era, a new beginning, a new relationship with God. Now, why is that important for you? Because those of you who are children of God, you need to remember and be reminded of your exodus passage. Sometimes it's easy for us to get caught up in the mundanes of life, the rituals of life, the hardships of life, and you forget what God did for you. You forget God split the waters and gave you a new exodus. I don't know where you are, but I am certainly glad that God split the waters for me. I don't know about you, but I know that where I was, what I used to do, what I have been, where I have been, I am thankful that it was by the hand and power of God that he gave me a new exodus. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? And in that new exodus, guess what? All of my past, all of that ugly stuff, the good, the bad, the ugly, and the worst, it's all behind me. And you too can be glad, you can celebrate the power and blessing of God because all that other stuff is gone. All the pharaohs that used to be in my life, they're gone. Right? All of the oppression that, that was plaguing me, all of the stuff I got myself in, all of that stuff is behind me. But well, when did it happen? When he split the wall. Are y'all hear what I'm saying to you? All right, all right. And so now Paul will carry on this motive of, of this new exodus, right? But it's going to take a death that will give you life. So it took the death of the Israelites through this watery grave of the Red Sea to usher in new life for the people of God. Well, it will take the death of Jesus. This death will now give us new life. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Now, he will answer the question because he, he, he knows there are some old smart Jews in here that will say, well, now, Paul, because in chapter 5, he will say, now, well, sin abound, grace much more. He will start to talk about how there was the first Adam, right? And through Adam, all men died. And then in this second Adam, which is Christ, all men are now made righteous. Are y'all with me? And so then he ends the chapter the chapter by saying, where grace abound, sin much more. Now, some old smart Jews would have said, well, goodness, Paul, that means that if sin, uh, if, if grace is greater than sin and God gives us a super abundance of grace, then that means I can keep on sinning because I've got all this grace in my life. Amen. So he answers the question before they ask it. And he says, no, you cannot live, you cannot, it is an impossible, uh, it is a spiritual impossibility to claim to be a child of God, to claim to have walked through this new exodus and still live a habitual practice and life of sin. Amen. Are y'all following what I'm saying? Amen. Yeah, yeah, so watch it. So he gets to chapter 6 and he says to them, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may increase? He says, may it never be. May it be far from me. May, matter of fact, be gone. That's the emphatically in the Greek. He said, be gone with such thinking. May it never be. How shall we who did what? Die to sin. How shall you continue to live in it? God saved you from your old life. He gave you a new passage. He 
gave you a new exodus. You now have a new king reigning over your life, and you want to stay stuck in your former life? May it never be. Now, so what, what do we have? Here's point number one. If you need to have a point, then you need to take notes. Oh, yes. Here it is. The, the first thing you need to, you have to have a proper understanding of the nature of your transformation. Yes. Now, here's what Paul will do. In chapter 1, verse 18, through chapter 3, verse 20, Paul will indict all of humanity, and they are guilty of sin. Yes. That's why he will say, all fallen short and come uh, and all have sinned rather and, and come short of the glory of God. He will he will indict Jew and Gentile all under sin. They need a remedy. They need a solution to the problem. Well in chapter 3 verse 21 he will begin to show us from chapter 3 verse 21 all the way into chapter 8 he will deal with our sanctification. Now that we have been justified by faith in Christ, we have a new life that we ought to live. So now he will say all men are indicted under sin. All have sinned, Jew and Gentile. Nobody has a right to point finger at the next man. Right. Y'all get real quiet here. No one has a right to say that my, that, that my life is better than yours. No one has a right to say that I have dotted all my I's and crossed all my T's. Because when you think that way, you have some misspelled words in your sentences. Yeah. So he says, all have sinned. All come under the indictment and the wrath of God. But Jesus will be the propitiation for our sins. Jesus is the divine satisfaction for sin. Y'all ain't catching that. Jesus is the only person that could satisfy God's divine wrath upon your sin. You can't save yourself. You can't offer a sacrifice for yourself. The only person that you can count on is the, the sinless perfection and sacrifice of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So he says, now here's the reality. The reality is all have sinned. Now because all have sinned, you need satisfaction. You need somebody to take up where you failed. Jesus comes along, he takes, and watch this, not only is he God's divine satisfaction, but he also takes, he took our place. So the death he died, we should have died. Amen. The, the death Jesus died, we should have been the ones nailed to the cross. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Those stakes should have been driven through our hands. Those stakes should have been driven through our feet. That crown of thorns should have been placed on our head. That side that was pierced, that should have been our side that was pierced. The only problem is he couldn't use us as a satisfaction because we are sinful people. Y'all tracking with me? So now, he, that's why he says to them in chapter 5, Therefore, being justified by faith, you now have peace with God. It, God justifies us. God declares us righteous when we now obey the Savior who saves us. That means God has acquitted. Every person that is a child of God, God has acquitted you of your wrong. Oh, this is good. He has, he has wiped our record clean even though we are guilty of some stuff. Amen. Now watch this. Everybody has come in here indicted with some sin. Amen. Everybody. But in God's mind, if you are his child, your record is clean. Amen. Amen. Everybody has a sin that they need God to get rid of. Amen. Everybody that has walked in here, you got a problem. You've got an issue. I know you like to get dolled up. I know you like to get suited up. You look the part. You even talk the part. You even sound the part. You even sing the part. Pray the part. Holy Father God in heaven. You say all of the right things. But at the end of the day, everybody's got some sin in their life. And thanks be to God, through Christ's sin, he washes me 
clean. And so even though I've got some faults, I can still walk in here and celebrate our Lord because I know my record is clean. Yeah, y'all hear what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. He, he, but now watch this. So he said, so you, Paul says, we need to understand the nature of our transformation. Because what he is doing, he is now going to show us that in Christ, we have been transformed. But then he's going to also show us the process of how we have been transformed. Watch it. He says, shall we continue, continue in sin? Uh, uh, where, where that grace may increase, may it, may it never be. How shall we who died to sin live in it any longer? Then he's going to remind them. He said, don't you know? Don't you remember that all of us who have been what? Yeah. Baptized into Christ have been baptized into his death. So now he shows us that baptism, church, it marks our transition from death to life. Yeah. So this death that Jesus, now there's two things that are working. You've got the death of Jesus, right? That's a propitiatory sacrifice. It's vicarious. Jesus gives his life so that we would be free from sin and death. Right? And the penalty that comes with sin yeah, right. and death. But then there is another death that takes place that now reaps the benefits of his death. Right. Therefore, we too must die. And that death, now this ain't symbolic in Paul's mind. No, Paul says there is a death. Just as sure as Jesus died, you must spiritually die. Right. And in order to reap the benefits and the blessings of the first death, you too must now die. But when and where does the death take place? In you gotta go through the water. Y'all ain't you gotta go through the water. Baptism, it's the Greek word baptizo that Paul uses. Baptism in your English translation is really not the uh the, the Greek equivalent. It's a transliteration where they take English words that are connected to the sound of the Greek word. So the translation is baptizo. It is then an immersion, a dipping, a plunging of one going under. It's when God splits the waters. But watch this. There is something Paul is going to show us that God does to us when we split the waters. Watch it, watch it. He said, don't you know that all of us who have been baptized, now I love that because he says all of us, which means there wasn't a group that did it this way and there was another group that did it this way. He says all of us did the same thing. And then he says uh, we were baptized into Christ and don't you know we have been baptized into his death. Therefore we have been what? Buried. So now this burial will consummate, it solidifies that something has died. You don't bury alive people. Right? Barbara and I just had to go to a funeral and that person wasn't alive. Now if that person would have got up, we got some issues. Fred wouldn't have been there. You hear what I'm saying to you? So then a burial consummates, right? It confirms that a death has taken place. So now, Paul says, don't you have now been buried? The buried, it's in, all of these are aorist tenses, which means it all happens, they all happen at the same time. So when I'm buried, it suggests that I was baptized. When I'm baptized, it suggests that I was buried. When I'm buried and baptized, it suggests that I have now entered into a death. Y'all with me? Yeah. Watch it, watch it, watch it. He says, he says, he says, therefore, we have been buried. Now notice who you're buried with. Him. Then he gives you the Greek word dia through baptism. That shows the it, it is the means, it is the uh it is the avenue of how we enter into this death. He says, you have been buried with him through 
baptism, and then ace into death. Ace is a Greek, and it signifies movement, transition from one place to another. That's it. it signified the exodus, y'all, that you are no longer in the same place you used to be. So if you want to get from point A to point B, guess what you got to do? You got to go through a new exodus. Well, how do I get through the new exodus? I've got to split the water. Y'all hear what I'm saying? And so this new exodus, he said, it comes through baptism. That's the nature of your transformation. So your transformation came about when you when you took part in this death. That's right. Right? That's right? In other words, church, in layman's terms, you should not be the same person you were pre-pandemic. Something about you should have changed. You should not be talking the same way now that you were pre-pandemic. You should not be treating people the same way you did pre-pandemic. Now y'all hear what I'm saying? Amen. I can do you one better. You shouldn't be the same person you were last year. Amen. You should not have the same old negative, stinking thinking that you had two years ago, three years ago, five years ago. Something about you should have changed and it should have taken place when you took part and willing in your willingness to die yeah. to self. That's why, as a matter of fact, this isn't different from what Jesus says. If any man wishes to come after me, let him first do what? Yeah. Deny self. Well, how do I deny self? By dying to self. Yeah. Let him first take up his cross. That's a death that should daily take place. And then follow me, right? Well, what, 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 what's the prerequisites, Jesus, that you deny self yeah. and then that you, you take up your cross, that you, be, you are willing to die yeah. to self? That's why so many Christian marriages, are, are the divorce rate amongst Christian marriages, Christian marriages are at an all-time high. Why? Because somebody or either both parties chose not to die. It speaks to the selfishness of someone in that marriage. You hear what I'm saying? And so you got to be willing to die. You got to. Both have to be willing to die. Are y'all here? Watch this. So it's, it means movement, transition from one place to another. It is the act that marks the movement, movement from living outside of Christ to now you resting in Christ. Y'all hear what I'm saying? And so this transition is a transition from the old life to the new life. It is a death to a whole way of living. Yeah. So just as Israel had to submit to God and Israel had to pass through that Red Sea. And now, here's the thing. You know it wasn't by faith only because they could have easily said, yeah, I believe that God, uh, I see he split the, the waters, Moses. I believe that, but I ain't going through it. You hear what I'm saying? That the faith could have could have rested at what they saw. It could have rested at them believing in God putting them ten plagues on Egypt, Egypt and all and Pharaoh. But it wasn't just them believing something to be true. They had to now act on what they believed was true. Right. You've got to, in order to go through your exodus, you've got to believe God can save you the same way he did these first century Christians. Right. 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 You hear what I'm saying? So, so the, the nature of this transition, y'all, you've got to understand the nature of it. And that is that baptism is a, tra it marks the transition from death to life. Now watch verse 5. He's all about verse 4. He says, therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead, through, through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in the newness of life. of life. When do I get this new life? When I put faith in Jesus, when I die to self, 
When I die to self, I must bury that old self. When I bury that old self, it suggests that I was baptized. And that baptism is a burial of my former life. And now, just as Jesus was raised, so I, well, all of us who have put faith in Jesus, are raised to a new life. In other words, it makes no sense to be entangled, to be trapped, to go back to what it used to be. Amen. Amen. That's it. Yeah, yeah. I hope y'all hope y'all caught that. As a as a new covenant child of God, you should stop looking at ministry as being what it used to be. Amen. 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 Come on, my friend. That's it. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. You should not. So here's the thing. It's time out for Christians to keep to stop saying what we used to do. Amen. You've been raised to walk in a new life. I know that rubs some of y'all the wrong way. And I'm glad it does because it's so easy for us to stay, Sister Hazel, where we are and always harp about what we used to do. How things used to be. Do you not know the first, even in the first century church, when you read the books, book of Acts, they didn't stay the way they started. They grew, multiplied, so much so that the, the Holy Spirit couldn't keep number. It started with 3,000. Then it said it, said it, it went to about it went to another group, another number, it multiplied, and it kept multiplying, that the, the Holy Spirit just stopped keeping count. Yeah. They grew. Well, think about it. Let me say this to you. You cannot duplicate the first century church. No, you can't do it. Are you willing to go back to living the way they did during the first century? No. 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 You got to reconstruct everything they did. As a matter of fact, if you just check your church history, if you if you do your Bible study properly, you'll find they took the communion at night. Yes, they did. Now, which one of y'all willing to come back 6 o'clock this evening to take communion? <laughs> See how quiet y'all are. Y'all so Paul preached to midnight. He preached so long in Acts 20, a young fellow fell out the window. Y'all remember? He got sleepy. Now, which one of y'all willing to let me preach to midnight? Y'all ready for me to quit now? You hear what I'm saying to you? You can't. Just hear what I'm saying. Now, I'm not telling you to change what's in the Bible. I'm telling you, sometimes when we rape, when God has raised us to a new life, he has given us the liberty to do things differently according to, watch this, according to the gifts that we all have, men and women. See, y'all got real quiet when I brought up the women. You mean to tell me God gave, he gave the brains uh, and the gifts only to men? Ah, uh, no, he didn't. Help me, help me. He didn't, exactly. So, because I, I know I would have a problem if, no, I'm digressing. I'm digressing. <laughs> come on back, come on back. Come on back, come on back. Yeah, and oh, we all work together with the gifts God has given us, men and women, so that the furtherance of God's kingdom will spread. Think about this, church. If it was just about men, then God would have left Adam by himself. But it was God who had enough sense to say it's not good for man to what? Let me give him, let me give, let me give him some common sense. Let me give him somebody with some sense. And he makes Eve. Well, there are women in God's kingdom who are gifted. Yeah, right. And in order for us to actually magnify and to do things on a high level, you got to use everybody. Yeah. Yeah. You follow what I'm saying? Yeah. All right, all right, all right. That, that was just a side note. That was just a side note. Secondly, you need to realize the reality of your transformation. 
Because some, now why you say, well, Fred, why is that important? Because some of us, we, we, we understand, yep, we've been saved um, by the blood of Jesus, right? We split the waters. God has given me a new exodus. But sometimes we don't embrace the reality of that new exodus. Yes, we don't embrace the reality. Because here's what happened. Satan puts a guilt trip on us. We wrong God, right? And then we start to think that we're not worthy. We start to think that God can't use us, right? We start to think that, look, and some of us, we get so guilt-ridden by the devil that some of us stop coming to worship. Amen, that's true. Amen. No, I, I, you know, God can't, I, I, I'm afraid you don't understand me. You don't understand the things that I've done. You don't understand the things that I have been doing. You don't understand what I've been engaged in. I don't. God does. And the blessing in God knowing is that it's only by God's power, love, and grace that he can clean up what you've been doing. Amen. Amen. Do you follow what I'm saying? All right. So now, so you need to understand the reality of this transformation. The reality of this transformation is that through baptism, he frees you. Watch this. He frees you to a freedom of holiness. So now, not only did he save you, but he severed you from your past. He severed you from some stuff, and he's now freed you up for a life of holiness. Amen. Watch it. Listen, listen, look, look at it. Look at it. He says, verse 6, verse 6. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him. In order, now look at the purpose, in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves. What the Israel, what the Israel slaves in Egypt? Yeah. Right. Well, in this new exodus, under this new covenant, guess what? When God frees you through splitting the waters, he frees you from sin. Yeah. Now, I know what your question is. Well, Fred... You know, well, well, explain to me, if God freed me from sin, then why do I keep sin? Why do I have this pull and this urge to sin? My question is, Fred, what did God really save me from? He saved you from the penalty of sin. You still have the propensity to sin. The flesh still calls you to do what you used to do. Right? It still urges you still have that urge. It's like those who have had an addiction. They fight, they struggle, and God knows you. That's why you should judge folks, because you don't know the struggle that they have. And here's the thing. They fight, they struggle, they have urges. Well, guess what? You are addict to some sin you have in your life. And you have to fight. You have struggle. Are you following what I'm saying? You have some stuff that keeps calling you to go back. You have that boo that keeps calling you to come back. Talk to me now, y'all. Come on, help me now. Right. Yeah, yeah. You got that babe that keeps calling you. Every time you see him, you know, you get goosebumps in your stomach. Girl, I just want to call him. The girlfriend said, You don't know what. Do you remember how he treated you? Yeah, girl, but this didn't. He didn't. You just don't know. You had, only you knew. Right? Yeah, but no. Uh, Paul says, no, he freed you from some stuff. Y'all think I'm crazy. I, I, I already know. Look, he freed you. He freed you from some stuff. And, and you know what? He didn't free you from some stuff. He freed you from a lot of stuff. Did he not? He freed you from some stuff that should have had you in the grave by now. Yeah. Yeah. He freed you from some stuff that should have had you in prison locked away. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that right? He freed you from some stuff. So then when he frees us, Ron, it makes no sense as to go. Watch it. Didn't, I'm trying to get off this. Didn't Israel have that problem today? Yeah. Yeah. The moment, now God gave, he, he, they saw the plagues God had put on Egypt, right? And then as they get ready to leave out of Egypt, God gives them gold. They can carry out with silver. They end up leaving rich. Yeah. All of that by the hand of God. As soon as they get out of Egypt. Now Moses, you brought us in this land to kill us. They start complaining to God. Or to Moses, rather. Who's going to give us food? Who's going to give us the drink? And then, you remember, 
they would often say it was better for us to stay in in Egypt. Yeah, that we aren't there graves in Egypt. Then they had the nerve to say, Moses, we used to eat palm grass. We had grapes and figs. Man, you were a slave. You ain't eat that. You didn't have any of that. Matter of fact, the best you could do was go pick that stuff for Pharaoh. You didn't eat that. Look at the thinking though. I'm used to to what it used to be. And so because it's comfortable for me, I'd rather stay back in Egypt. Yeah. Don't you let the devil cause you to stay in Egypt. When God has freed you, he's freed you from Egypt. You hear what I'm saying to you? So watch this, now watch this. So he says, he says, now if, verse eight, if we have died or since, there should be since we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him knowing that Christ having been raised from the dead is never to die again. Death no longer is a master or reigns over him. Stop allowing people, your past, your hangups to define who you are. They no longer have mastery over you. You have a new person in charge of your, your life. That's the man Jesus Christ. He says this, this your former life doesn't have mastery over you. He personifies sin by saying sin doesn't reign over you any longer. No wonder Paul was saying in chapter 8, there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Isn't that right? So now he's showing up. He says you have been freed. You now live. Now what's the power in this? He says, knowing that, verse 9 again, having been raised from the, knowing that Christ was raised from the dead and is never to die again. Death no longer is mastered over him. For the death that he died, he died once to sin, or he died to sin once for all. But the life he lived, he now lives to God. Well, guess what? When you connect with Jesus through death, you notice what happens? You too live with Christ. Well, as sure as Christ was raised to live and never to die again, so the child of God is raised to live and never die again. Look at the blessing of your salvation and your transformation. You aren't the same person. You are, when he raises you, you now live to live and reign with him forever. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? Think, now let that soak in. Let, 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 let one comedian said, let that sizzle in your spirit. Think about that. When he raises me, death has no more reign over me. When he raises me, sin has no more control of me. Yeah, you'll have to pull, but now that's why it's important to now live by faith in Jesus Christ. Right? Watch it, watch it, watch it. He says, uh, for death that he died, he dies to sin once for all, but the life he lived, he lives to God. Now he says, now, if you know all of this, consider yourselves also to be dead to sin, Amen. but alive to God in Christ, which means now that I've been raised, I no longer live to myself. I now live to the God who saved me from myself. Amen. You all with me? So now, the, the second point is you need to know the reality of your transformation. And that, that is, baptism is a freedom for holiness. Uh-huh. But when he says, when he says now, consider that and in other words, reckon, count, keep on. It's it, it's in the present tense with me. Keep on considering that you've been raised with him. Keep on considering that you have life with him. Keep on considering. That he has raised you just like he raised the son. Keep on considering that you have a new life, a new exodus, a new beginning. He says, keep that in the forefront of your mind and don't you dare forget it. Watch this. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies. Here's the, here's the last one. You need to understand the response that there is a response. There should be, should I say, a response to your transformation. So now you understand that there is a transformation that takes place. You understand that uh, the nature of this transformation, that baptism marks 
uh, a, a death and into a new life, right? Mm -hmm. Then you understand that baptism is a freedom to holiness. But then from all of that, there should be a proper response from you. Watch the response. Therefore, do not let sin reign, rule in your mortal body so that you obey its lust. Hmm. Reign, exercise kingly power where Jesus is supposed to occupy. He says, don't allow sin to rule there, right? Don't allow sin to live there. Sometimes, church, if we just be practical, there are some people you can't allow to live in your life. Sometimes there are some people you just have to say, you know what? I am going to evict you out of my life. No longer do you have the, the free range to live in my life and in my mind. Right? That's just the reality. There are some people you got to evict. Right? And so, um, and, 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 and some of them quicker than others. Yeah, you know, some, see, sometimes what we, see, I try to get off. Sometimes what we try to do, we try to give people 30 day notices. <laughs> don't we don't want it. We try to give them 30, we try to, we try to give them the benefit of the doubt. All you really say is I'm giving you a 30 day notice. And then when the 30 days come up, they're still there. Right? And then they bring more baggage. No, no, you got to go on and get, you got to get the sheriff involved. And you got to get them out of your life. And that right? You got to evict them. Uh, yeah, yeah. He, so he says, don't allow sin to reign. Then he says, and do not go on presenting your bodies, your members, the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but now present yourselves to God as those who are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of of righteousness to God. So he says, listen, stop allowing your mind to be a tool for the devil. Stop allowing what you say to people to be a tool for, in other words, guard your tongue. Just don't blurt out and say what you feel you want to say. I know some people, they get on your last nerve from time to time, right? And the easiest thing is for me to just give them a peace of mind. <laughs> Y'all, yeah. right? No, so Paul said, no, don't use your tongue as an instrument of unrighteousness, right? Don't use, don't use evil spirit. Don't allow that evil spirit to consume you where you become a tool of the devil. Yeah. That's what he's saying. He says, man, don't present your body. Because in chapter 12, he'll get to the practical application of that. And he'll say, present your bodies <laughs> as a living well, it presupposes that something was dead before. When did the death take place? When I split the waters. Yeah. When I buried that old man. Isn't that right? So he says, stop presenting yourself as an instrument of unrighteousness. Right. But rather present yourself as one uh, who's wanting to be used as a tool of righteousness. Yeah. Right. <sighs> yeah. So... When you work on ministry, the next time you get involved with something, stop gossiping. Amen. Mm. Put a camera on, man. All right. Stop always allowing the devil to cause you to say some stuff that you know you aren't willing to, 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 to lend a hand to. Amen. Come on. All right. Because we like to talk a good game. We like to say of what I did, what I used to do, or what I would do. And then when it's time for you to do it, you are no call, no shot. You don't show up. Now, you hear what I'm saying? Now, I'm trying not to do that. I know we're on camera. I'm trying, but here's the reality. We get a whole lot of Christians that's always talking stuff. But then when you give them an assignment or you say, okay, well, take this and run with it, they don't do anything with it. Because all they do is this. And then the people who do work, Sister Hazel, here's what they do. They get in that air to discourage them. Or sometimes they just flat out get jealous of them. And you try to stop what they're doing instead of just simply getting involved. Yeah. 
You hear what I'm saying? Yes, sir. So he says, so stop using your body as a tool of unrighteousness. Mm -hmm. But rather, allow yourself to be used as an instrument mm -hmm. that God can positively use to bless his kingdom. Amen. You hear what I'm saying? Amen. To be a benefit to his kingdom. Now that begs the question to you. What benefit are you to God? Now you got to ask yourself that. Answer that. What benefit, or let me say it this way, what benefit have you been to the kingdom of God lately? Well, have you been have you been a benefit to the devil? Or have you been a tool for righteousness? Now I'm not making that up. Y'all just read that, right? So the question you need to answer before you leave here today, what God Help me see what benefit I can be to your kingdom. Amen. That's a good question. Amen. Yes, it is. Very good question. What benefit am I? What benefit have you been? What benefit are you willing to be mm -hmm. for God's service? Guess what it's going to have to take? It's going to have to take a death that will bring life. That's what it will take. You got to die to self. Mm -hmm. You got to die to your own uh, agenda. You got to die to what you want, yeah. how you want it. Yeah. You got to die. And church, man, ministry congregations abroad would, would, would be so much more fruitful if people adopted a selfless mentality. Yeah. Yeah. You got to die to self. Yeah. But and if you, the failure to do that is that you don't understand the nature of transformation. You don't understand that you were buried. That's right. Yeah, you were buried for a purpose. Now I didn't get to the part where he says we have we have been united with Christ. Yeah. That united, the word unite literally means to be grafted in mm -hmm. with another. Isn't that right? right? Not just planted, but to be grafted. Right. Like you graft a plant to another plant, plant or a tree. He says it's like being Siamese twins. So when a side, you know, Siamese twins, there are two bodies that share the same blood. Right? Uh, well, Paul says, when it comes to you being buried in Christ, you are not just buried in, with Christ. You have been united with Christ. You ought to be Jesus' Siamese twin. Amen. Because here's the reality. You live of the blood of Jesus. <laughs> you are nourished and carried and cared for by Christ. Amen. Isn't that right? Yeah. And so we ought to be his twin right. on earth. Amen. Now I already know what's going to happen. Some of y'all going to walk right out of here with the same mindset. <laughs> <laughs> you are. You are. Some of y'all going to walk right out of here with the same negative spirit. With the same gossiping spirit, right? With the same tearing down spirit. You will still walk with the same pessimistic spirit. Yeah. You know, some of y'all just won't get it. You're going to walk out of it. And here's the thing your life eventually will transform into being a miserable life. Mm -hmm. Because you refuse to change. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You refuse to accept the transformation God is trying to work in your life. Right. Yeah. That's why you don't have many friends, physically and on Facebook. <laughs> that's why. That's why people unfriend you right now, because of your spirit. You refuse to be. You can't. Don't know what to say. You do know what to say. You just don't care what you say. You just run people off. You become a repellent. Man, it's time out. But life is too short. I just went to a funeral yesterday where this person died suddenly. They were just talking to another sister about how much they loved them and about, and about how much they were going to do some great things for God. But they died suddenly. Life is too short to be holding on to all that stuff. Man, that so you hear what I'm saying? Life is too weighty, man, to be holding on to grudges, yeah. to be holding on to baggage that you yeah. should have let go a long time ago. 
It is time out for that. If you should have learned something, no scratch that. We should have learned something from what this pandemic taught us. Y'all yeah. hear what I'm saying? Oh, man, we got to get past that. But how do you do it? You got to die to self. Something needs to die. Now, only you can determine what needs to die. And when you determine what needs to die, then you need to answer that question I asked you. How can I be a benefit to God's kingdom? Amen. Now, when you do that, then you say, well, your next question was, Fred, tell me again, how do I do this? How do I, how do I come into this death and reap the benefits of this death you talked about? By being buried. 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 Water. Water. Splitting the waters. And when you split the waters, you come through into a new exodus. Right? You have a new person reigning over your life. And then at that point, you're ready to eat at the table. Yeah. We hadn't even got to that part yet. We hadn't got to that part. That's another powerful lesson. Table fellowship. But you can't come to the table until you first come through the water. Remember I told you, mama wouldn't let me eat so ain't going until I washed my hand. I went out there and played. When she told me the food was ready, I couldn't come to the table until I had gone through some water. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. How do you do it? By being put faith in the Lord Jesus. You express that faith in the watery grave of baptism. Amen. But when he raises you, he raises you to a new life, and he raises you to pass through a new exodus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? That new exodus says, now I have all of the nourishment and the sustenance that comes from the death of Christ, but not only the death of Christ, but his resurrection. Everything is afforded us when we come through the waters. Yeah. If you need prayer, you need strength, you need you need the power of God to, to resonate in your life, well, there is nothing wrong with asking for prayer. It is nothing wrong with asking that admitting to God that you're weak. Yeah. That's right. See, the problem with us, we want we believe the world's lie and that we all can live independent lives. Yeah. 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 And you can't do it. And so that's why you have so many people suffering alone. Mm -hmm. They're in depression alone. Mm -hmm. They're having suicidal thoughts alone mm -hmm. because they think that they can handle it independent. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. And you can't do it. Yeah. So if you need to respond, I pray that you do so as together we stand and we sing the invitation song. <laughs>